Hey guys, this is Armin from The Watchbox. Uh, I'm just about to go through a few YouTube questions that may or may not have been hit. Let's just jump right into it. So Tom Kong on YouTube is saying, I don't see H. Mosier much. Is it really so rare? Uh, yes, actually, is the short answer to that. Mosier makes about 1,200 watches a year, and these are the type of watches that true collectors do buy, and they buy them to hold on to. So we don't always see them on the secondary market. I think we're lucky enough to have a few other pieces currently. Uh, but it is a brand for collectors to purchase and enjoy. You don't really see them being flipped or traded very often. Ugami, Ugami Ito from YouTube asks, what kind of fool wants Snoopy on a luxury watch? Ridiculous. Well, it seems like his mind may already be made up, but uh, looks like the market is saying different. I think a lot of people uh, like the just the fun aspect of having something a little less serious on the dial of their watch. It's not like Omega sought out a random cartoon character to be the face of this line of watches. Snoopy has a relationship with NASA to the effect of their call signs were Charlie Brown and Snoopy during the manned space missions. The Silver Snoopy Award and Snoopy in general is kind of a token of appreciation, truthfully, to the Speedmaster. And the Silver Snoopy Award is held in a very high regard in NASA. Snoopy's a great example, whether it be one of the few Silver Snoopy Speedmasters or uh, the Timex collaboration that was done. You know, some people take it more seriously than others, and some like to uh, let a little fun in there. Tim Siragusa from YouTube is asking, how do you know if it's a legit Tiffany dial? I'm gonna assume this is a paddock-directed question, just because when we hear Tiffany dial in the industry, it's usually a paddock. So there are a couple ways to know for sure. The first is perhaps the most obvious. If the watch is a complete set, if it has all the paperwork, Tiffany is going to be on the paperwork. We have had watches with Tiffany on the paperwork without a stamp on the dial, and little known fact, you can send it into Paddock to get that stamp if you're the original owner with Tiffany's on the paperwork. Short of the paperwork, you can contact Tiffany directly with the serial numbers of your watch and see if it was distributed through their network. If the watch is naked, no boxer papers, and has a Tiffany stamp, an aftermarket or a fake Tiffany stamp should be noticeable in terms of application, size, and clarity of the writing. But truthfully, if it's naked and Tiffany won't confirm it, there's no way to know for sure. Rodrigo Quintero Bejarano from YouTube is asking, Datejust or Submariner as a daily? This is a great question, and before I had my Datejust stolen from me, I used it as a daily wear. I absolutely love the Datejust as a daily. The Submariner is a fantastic piece, but does look a little purposefully sporty. And while I know a lot of people that wear it daily, for myself, for if it were my money, I would go Datejust. And Ultimately, you know, I have about a seven inch wrist. I would probably go 36 millimeter. It's that classic size. It's easy to wear. If you need to jump in a pool, if you need to jump in the water, shower, hot tub, those two, those last two things, probably not recommended. The Submariner is an awesome piece and actually on my personal short list as probably it's on a lot of people's personal short lists. But I think it's a little too purposefully sporty to be worn every single day. That being said, you know, if you work in a casual environment, um, unlike me with my three-piece suit, uh, you know, the sub, the sub could absolutely be daily, but any type of business casual, I, I'm on the side of date just, personally. Maxime Plessy-Abushi from YouTube is asking, what is the role of the brands themselves in the bubble? What would the consequence of a burst be, and would they do anything to actively prevent it? You know, this is an interesting, <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting question. Let me tell you. All right, when we talk about a bubble in the watch industry over these past year and a half, two years, we're really discussing two brands, and that's Rolex and Paddock. I truthfully don't believe that Rolex or Paddock saw this coming, saw the inflated prices, saw the insanity behind the market. Because I don't think they started it or helped cause it, I don't know if they can do anything to prevent it from bursting or to slow the market prices from coming down, as they will eventually. Thierry Stern had a good take on it, on the Nautilus market, on the steel market, on the craze and the push behind the prices. 
And he's saying they're not increasing production of the Nautilus because that's not all that they make. Patek Philippe is known for complications. They're known for excellence. The Nautilus is not the DNA of Patek Philippe. It is currently one of the spearheads of the market, but that's not all that they produce. And touching on Rolex a little bit. <laughs> uh, there we go. <laughs> touching on Rolex a little bit, up until I guess as close to about a year, year and a half ago, you could go into pretty much any Rolex store and buy a steel sports model. Maybe not a Daytona, maybe not the hottest GMT master, but you could go in, you could buy a sub, you could buy a no date sub, you could find a Milgauss with the blue dial. So it's not so much that the brands did anything, more that the demand increased significantly to the point where truthfully, those two brands can't keep up. Reno2324 from YouTube is asking, what would you recommend for a one watch guy? So to use this every day, suits, the beach. Reno, good question. What would you recommend for a one watch guy? This is a bit of a loaded question because a lot of people have different tastes. So me personally, I'm wearing a strap right now. I prefer a bracelet. I like a watch on a bracelet. That would be my pick for a daily wear. I know there are a lot of guys that like straps, that like to change straps regularly. So I like the best of both worlds personally. A, a daily wear to me is something that comes on a bracelet, but also looks good on a calf leather strap. I'm not the biggest alligator guy, but you know, a calf strap, a NATO strap, a rubber strap, something that doesn't look out of place on either a bracelet or a strap. And for the the idea of daily wearing beach to boardroom type deal, get something with some water resistance and ultimately I guess something not overly complicated. I, in terms of a daily wearing watch, I do like something that's simple, that's readable at a glance. A date is very useful. I, I do prefer the aesthetic of a no date, but a date is extremely useful and a lot of people actually use their watch for the date more so than the time. So when one considers a one watch collection, it's a really, it's actually a big undertaking to consider. It's, for one thing, it has the potential of increasing your budget, which helps. You don't have to build in, oh, this will be my sports watch. This will be my dress watch. I have to take my budget and pick two watches. You can take your budget and pick one watch. It's just the question of your daily activities. Are you in an office every day? Are you in the elements every day? Your daily wearing watch is going to be very dependent on your lifestyle. So that's a bit of a hard question to answer, truthfully. All in all, I would say get something to match your lifestyle. If you work outside with your hands, get something that's a tank, get something on a bracelet or that you can put on a NATO. If you're in an office, you're wide open. You can get whatever you want. You can wear a Submariner every day. You can wear a complicated paddock every day. Basically get something that matches your lifestyle. I'm just gonna leave that right there. <laughs> what is this now? <laughs> Andre Budiman on YouTube asks, hello, I'm very curious if you are vaping. Does the vape will broke the material or movement over time? Yes. I, I wasn't being dumb. That was a nonsensical question, right? Okay. <laughs> O'Neill Miller from YouTube is asking, what are your thoughts on who is the cart and who is the horse? Do collectors really do the picking or are we fast followers of the influencers? This is an interesting question and there's a little bit more to it than that. Watches are in an interesting spot right now. They're very cool. It's cool to be into watches right now. And this is large in part due to social media. Uh, I do think influencers do have a big effect. But I like to hope that the true collectors will be out there buying what they're going to buy, regardless of what somebody on Instagram or YouTube or any media platform says. Instagram in general has had a large influence on what is cool in the watch world. You'll see a lot of brands like Jacob & Co or Christopher, Christopher, Christopher Claret, you can leave that in. <laughs> Um, on Instagram and these are pieces that truthfully you just don't see in real life. You don't see them in the wild often. Again, not something you're going to go into a boutique and see. 
So I don't believe that type of influencing does anything to the market other than bring awareness to these more to these brands that are more on the fringe. Now, when you see an influencer wearing a Nautilus or a Daytona, yeah, that's going to get a lot of attention. That's going to get people to be really into whatever they see on this wrist and research it. Ultimately, the brands pay the influencers to wear their watches. It is marketing. There's not a defined order. It's not brands pick the watch to influence, influencer, influencers influence, and then we as cheap collectors buy. It's not that. It's more of it's more of watches speaking to a wide audience. So, for instance, the Daytona speaks to a very wide audience. Sure, some people might not like chronographs or be into racing or the history of the Daytona, but ultimately it's a good looking watch. At the end of the day, when you're staring at it on your wrist, you're going to be happy with it, more than likely. So I don't necessarily think that there's this order or hierarchy of brand, influencer, initial consumer, and then end consumer. I think it's more of markets play out, people buy what they want, influencers show what they're paid to show. Fafanopolis? Fafanopolis from YouTube says, the Breitling Emergency 2 only cool if you're the type of dork that carries a ferro rod on their keychain and a paracord bracelet on their wrist. Also, this guy has a terrible catfish whisker leg mustache. I love this comment. I... <laughs> I agree with that last part. It is a terrible catfish whisker like mustache. I'm working on it. Uh, for my headshots, I actually had it filled in a little bit, so it should be looking a little better today. Brightly Emergency 2 is a cool watch. I mean, I, I don't even know what a ferro rod is uh, or a keychain, much less, but I do know what a Brightling Emergency is. And it's massive and kind of resembles a hockey puck, but I'll be damned if it's not cool. It, broadcast a signal for up to 24 hours on two different two different radio waves, two different channels. That's cool. It doesn't have to be wearable. It doesn't have to be reasonable to be cool. It's cool. These are just a few of the unanswered questions on, on our YouTube channel. Please ask more. Um, this is fun for us. We love reading these questions as hopefully through this video you can tell. Um, if you have any questions directed at me, please find me at Instagram. It's me, Armand. Or you can email me, armand.gotbergwatches.com. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed.